Hey FishTube, Steven here with an update on the Live Bearer Mosh Pit. It's been a while since I've last given you a proper update on this tank, like a year and a half. Uh, life gets in the way, but guess what? I'm back! The Live Bearer Mosh Pit. It's going on four years old now, and this project, if you'd even call it a project, has been slow. Intentionally very slow. While the rest of my fish room is a constant work in progress with an ever-growing mental list of ideas and hopes and dreams, this 40-gallon mosh pit doesn't look much different than it did in my first video of this tank from early 2021. Probably the most noticeable change is the plant life. Since that first video, I've gone lidless. I hate cleaning them, and I hate how much light they block as they get dirty, so I've tried to go lidless on as many tanks as I can. The ones with fish that don't recreationally jump to their doom. I'm looking at you, rainbow fish. But anyways, going lidless makes it easier to grow immersed plants like pothos and whatever this thing is, and floating plants like duckweed, water lettuce, duckweed, and duckweed. And then underneath the layer of duckweed, I always have a tangled mess of plants like guppy grass, pearlweed, some hygrophilas. Nothing high tech or demanding, just something for the guppy fry to hang out in. In fact, even though I added a second Nycru light to the tank, only plants that really thrive below this tangled mess are the typical low light easy stuff like Anubius and Java Fern and Grips and Dwarf Sagittaria. I guess I could remedy the lighting issue if I were more diligent about thinning out the duckweed more often, but I don't know if I've ever been diligent about anything in my life, ever. So plants, yay, whatever, who cares? What about the f***ing guppies? Last I left you, I was looking to add new genetic to the mosh pit and also prevent the wild type guppy pattern from taking over the gene pool completely. Not that there's anything wrong with them, I just didn't want them to become the only type in here. So task number one was to remove the males that look like this and like this. These are yellow tiger inlers, a K-class inler which means it's a hybridization of a guppy and an inler and where I believe most of these came from. Removing them has taken uh, a year and a half, not because it had to take that long but because my my attention span is too short to stick to any kind of routine. So the strategy, if you'd call it that, was to remove them when I saw them. If I even remembered at the time to do that, and if I felt like it at the time and there was a net nearby. And I'm not done culling yet. I may never be done because the females in here will probably continue popping out these one-off wild types for a while. Now when I say cull, I'd like to clarify that I do not mean I disposed of the fish. These guppies are healthy, vibrant, lively, they still deserve a good life. So some of them live in this plant farm, others live in this pond, and many, many more live in other people's tanks. These guppies have helped jumpstart quite a few mosh pits for other fish keepers, and I'll tell you with a lot more initial success than I had. I mean, if you want a bulletproof fish, here it is. So real quick, I'll say the rest of the inhabitants are doing just fine as well. The panda quarry is still serving as the completely unnecessary cleanup crew, but I love quarries, so I'm never gonna not have quarries. And look at these platies. The ones you're seeing here are not the same ones from the last video. I've sold or given away most of those. Um, not intentionally, it just worked out that way. And I ended up bringing in these gorgeous blue coral platies from Dan's Fish. Could not resist. And then there are these calico platies I got from Jess of the Aquatic Morning Show. Again, could not resist. The platies, they do bring a chunky little addition to the bio load and they very much enjoy eating guppy fry. But they breed slower and they sure are pretty. I've noticed the shrimp population has taken a hit since I cut down on feeding during this guppy removal process. Speaking of food, what do guppies eat? Well, everything. They are little garbage disposals. When I feed this tank, I go for a variety. Wafers and flake food are the staples, of course. I tend to keep a mixture of flake food types together in one container, usually spirulina or vegetables, and krill or worms or bugs or all of the above. Then I try to frequently include live baby brine shrimp, live grindle worms, decapsulated brine shrimp eggs, and freeze-dried food. And if I just want some entertainment, it's the Sarah O'Nip treat tabs all the way. I'm always looking to add more foods in the rotation, so what do you like to feed your guppies? Leave me a comment. But most importantly, guppies are detrivores, which is a really big part of what makes this seemingly overstocked tank work so well. Nothing really goes to waste in here. I tend to feed only four or five times a week, or nothing for an entire week if we're traveling, but the guppies are eating all the time. Biofilm and other microorganisms, any little critter that 
might be hiding in the substrate, decaying plant matter, their own babies, and even some soft algae. Therefore, the surface of the gravel stays pretty clean. There is never a buildup of mulm anywhere in the tank, and it's certainly not because I'm diligently cleaning it. The sponge filter, I haven't cleaned it in three years. I didn't even have to clean the inside glass before filming this. My maintenance routine for this tank is pretty simple. A 50% water change every week because whether or not a tank technically needs that water change, fresh clean water has only ever proven to be beneficial in my fish room. As part of the water change, I have to add minerals to my tank and I use Nylock G GH Boost to keep the general hardness at around 10 degrees. And then every few weeks or so, I'll give the media in this AquaClear 110 a rinse along with the pre-filter sponge. And if the mood strikes, I'll thin out the duckweed, I guess. And that's really it. So future plans, what's next for this mosh pit? Probably not much besides observation and maintenance and just overall enjoyment. Doing this genetic mix up with the guppies was a huge change and risky. Not necessarily something I want to make a habit of doing. In fact, the more I think about it, the more insane it sounds. Things could have gone very wrong. For one thing, I wasn't exactly keeping a record of how many fish I took out of the tank versus how many I added, and removing and adding so many fish could have caused the environment to become way unbalanced. I could have increased the bio load, adding too many fish at once, or caused some kind of undesirable shift in the tank dynamics by, say, changing the guppy sex ratio or the adult to fry ratio too quickly. And then let's not ignore the fact that new fish from the scary outside world means new pathogens to infect my existing guppy population, which might already be stressed by the other changes I was making. But I guess I could say I'm lucky that nothing went wrong. I at least learned my lesson about quarantining four years ago when this mosh pit was almost a total failure before it even got started. So this time around, even though these new guppies came from various hobbyist breeders, from people I know personally and trust, not a single one entered the mosh pit for at least six months. Holding the new guppies in other tanks actually gave them time to reproduce, and it gave me time to transfer more of the wild type males out of the mosh pit and not add any fish for the time being. I went so slow with this, in fact, that a lot of the adult guppies I got from hobbyists had aged out. They only live a couple years. And so most of the new additions ended up being fry and juveniles. And I'd say this whole process went swimmingly, get it? Because ultimately I think I removed more bio load than I added. That was well over six months ago and I'm happy to report no crashes, no diseases or mass die offs. Now, part of the goal here was to add variety. Specifically, I wanted an assortment of blue guppies, different patterns, different tails, different color values. So did I achieve that goal? Eh, kinda not really. You can see there's one type here that's ultimately going to win out. It's smaller, short tailed and faster than the other types, but I'm okay with that. A question I get from time to time is if I had to do this all over again, like start the mosh pit brand new, knowing what I know now, what would I do differently? A few things. Of course, I'd start with a verified good source of guppies. No need to relive that nightmare of imported guppies that love to die. I'd stick with the blue variety since I know that's what I prefer now. I've also become a little bit better at aquascaping over the years, so I'm sure the layout would look a lot different. Maybe I'd go a couple inches thicker on the substrate, possibly use sand instead of gravel, but you know what? We live and learn, and at the end of the day, this tank is still a pride and joy. It continues to amaze and entertain and thrive, and I'm just eager to see how it further evolves and give you the next update. But don't expect any rapid changes. I'm in no hurry, and honestly, when it comes to keeping a healthy, balanced aquarium, none of us should ever be in a hurry. Hey, did you know there's a community of people just like you here on YouTube? You can hang out with us right here on this channel every Friday night at 8.30 p.m. Central for our live stream, and you can find out more about the community, including other live streams, at fishfam.link. If you enjoy this video, hit the like and subscribe for more videos to come. Thanks so much, and I'll see you later.